North Carolina picks up their fifth ACC win of the season, but it was a little more difficult than maybe we expected. Coach Pat Kilby and I are going to talk about why coming up on today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, joining me as he does every Wednesday, our guy, Coach Pack Kilby. We want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or watch every single day. Seriously, the, ch- the show is growing like crazy. Audio downloads, YouTube subscriptions. We are so grateful. Thank you. If you're here for the very first time, welcome. We are glad that you're here. On today's show, we're going to unpack Carolina's victory over Boston College on Wednesday night in the Smith Center, 72 to 64. We'll give you our four corners recap, our shady and Kilby stats of the game. We'll have some odds and ends, quick hitters later on. But first, we want to get into a conversation about one of the biggest things. Pac, you and I started t- uh, texting about this actually in the middle of the game was this Carolina team, and and we've seen this in past Carolina teams, but at this point in the season, seems to have an inability to make things easy on themselves and to put teams away. We've seen multiple games with um, the like end of first half, uh, taking the foot off the gas, letting the team back in a little bit. Uh, You'll go from like, there's been multiple examples of having like a a double digit second half lead or a nine point second half lead and letting a team get it down. Like even Louisville got it back down to seven on Saturday today or last night, excuse me, in the game against Boston college, they got it down to one point with six minutes left to go in the game. So Pac, what are you seeing that led you to text me last night? This team has to learn how to put opponents away. Well, I think there's several things. The first thing to me is, the lack of bench depth being used mm. in the second half. Um, <laughs> there's so many times where, like, I feel like we got the lead to nine, and then the guys on the court were exhausted and gave up a couple plays or took a couple plays off defensively. And next thing you know, Boston College hits a couple baskets, and it's back to a five point game. And it felt like we did that several times. And so, uh, to me, I guess my biggest question or concern is, is you know, why is Tr- why why is Trimble not being used? He didn't play at all in the second half. Yep. Um, Just uh, what did we say? Five minutes in the whole game. Three in the entire game. Three in the entire game. That's right. Yeah. He goes from starting two games to playing three minutes, and that kind of goes back to previous conversations we've had, where it's like, what's my role? You know, how how can I get comfortable in what I'm doing whenever it's up and down all the time, and so. Um, to me, that's a concern, and and it's a concern because our starters are playing so many minutes. Yep. You know, and, and that was what we talked about after the national championship last year was we want to see this team get away from that, yep. and we think we can, and we haven't. And so, to me, I think that's why we're not putting them away. But then you also got to look at uh, we had some untimely turnovers, and then we had some untimely Caleb Love selfish shots too, and they were like early in the shot clock or – um, just really quick, somewhat contested. Not what we're looking for when we're trying to put teams away. Um, to me, it should be an identity of let's stretch this thing out. Let's give it to Baycott and play through him. Yes, and so. and that's something I want to talk about even more later in the show is, is playing through Baycott more consistently, which Carolina has to continue to do. But, I mean, to your point uh, of the starters p- continuing to play too many minutes – both Leakey and RJ played the entire second half. Leakey led the team with 37 minutes. You're coming off a game at, at Louisville where Caleb Love was the only play, person to play more than 30 minutes. And in this one, all five starters played 30 or more minutes. And so, yeah, that that alone um, – comes into play and i know there's this whole thing and people say well these these, uh, 18 and 22 year old boys they can do this they can get up and down but when you're exerting that much effort for that sustained an amount of time you you just can't and when you have guys that could come in because I, i think a lot of times the perception from people with with the defensive issues and 
is that people think, oh, they're just taking a couple plays off. They don't figure it out. But it's literally sometimes exhaustion, right, from, from playing so hard. Mm -hmm. And even if you could just steal a couple more minutes here and there to get these guys off their feet, you feel like you could go at a higher level defensively. Like um, somebody was asking yesterday, we did a, a live immediate reaction to Ian Jackson's commitment. And somebody said, man, with all these guards Coach Davis is stockpiling, you – you think he'll legitimately start going with some more defensive, like full court or half court pressure, whatever it may be. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it points to that, but only if you're playing your depth because guys can't do that. If they're all playing as much as they are Pack from your, what you experience with your teams as a coach, how much of what you see with the defensive lacks or the, those breaths that Carolina takes that seem to let a team go on a little bit of a run, how much of that is a team feeling like, ah, we're up nine, I can I can take a little bit of a breath? How much of it is like, I've been going so hard that I literally can't guard right now? Yeah, I think it's – I mean, you're hitting the nail on the head. It's, it's a mixture of both. Okay. Um, you know, I think we all know we're not blind. There's There has been times where, like, you know, Caleb – love specifically has taken some plays off and just done boneheaded things. But then I, I genuinely believe most of the time when defensive mistakes occur, at least with this team, I think they're exhausted. I think they're mm. tired. I mean, look, mm. Leakey's playing 37 minutes and we expect him to be the dude defensively. You know, I mean, you know how hard it is to play defense for 37 straight minutes. That's, that's tough. Especially now that he's taking on more of an offensive load. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, golly, I, I just think it's brutal. And look, to me, I mean, I'm not at practice every day, but DeMarco brings some really good stuff defensively. Let's, and obviously offensively too. He's been shooting the ball pretty well. Let's play him some more. Let's trust him. We know Trimble brings good stuff defensively. Mm -hmm. Trust him with it. Mm -hmm. Huff although not leaky, is still pretty darn good defensively and maybe a little better offensively, especially when it pertains to stretching the floor. So, you know, I don't know. I just – I find it interesting we haven't been trusting them to come in and provide some relief. And back to your – you know, back to your point about depth, the way we play, we play 10 deep. And a lot of times you'll see our games, which is quarters, through about two and a half, three quarters, it'll be close. But that depth prevails, and it starts to stretch out over the fourth quarter when we play. And I think we could do a lot of that at North Carolina. I think that we saw a lot of that with Roy Williams. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I would, I would love to see us get back to that. And I know, mm -hmm. I know they're different. I don't expect them to be the same. I'm not saying that, but I would like to see us use our depth more and just wear people down. Yeah. And I don't think like I've heard, I feel like I've seen multiple uh, or a lot of comments from the fan base in the past couple of days of like, it looks like the players don't care or they're disengaged or disinterested. I'm not necessarily seeing that. I mean, these guys put everything they have into this. This is literally their lives. And for several of them is going to be their livelihoods. Like I, I, I'm not necessarily buying that, but I would, the part of it that I do agree with is there's almost like there's got to be this paradigm shift where the Tar Heels figure out like, what are the things we have to do to break a team's will? For example, I'll go back to the Pittsburgh game. I feel like if Carolina had been able to push out that first half lead instead of letting Pitt kind of claw their way back a little, Carolina still had a halftime lead, but it was smaller than it should have been. Had Carolina pushed that out to 10, 12, 15 points, that ball game's over and Carolina get, gets out of there with a win. As we know, Pitt hung around long enough and did what they needed to do down the stretch. So how do you how do you switch that mindset to literally I'm so engaged every second, every moment that I'm not going to allow a team to do that? Well, a lot of it comes from veteran leadership, you know, and the why I say that is because – to me, all it is is – I say all it is. It's it's difficult to do, but it's just locking in on the little things and um, specifically defensively, right? Like communicate, you know, know how we're guarding the ball screens, know yeah. how we're 
Are we switching the down screens? You know, all those little things where it feels like, like tonight, a couple times, we didn't open up on a screen and Boston College curled right off of it and shot a couple layups. Uh, it was done. That was trailing one time. But, and to, to everybody else, it probably looked like, oh, Dunn got caught on the screen and he got beat. No, whoever was supposed to open up didn't let him get through. Right. You know, and so just little things like that where it's like, all right, we can do this. And we didn't lock in and, and on those details of the game and, and get it done. Hmm. But then on the offensive end, and we've, we've already mentioned this, so I'll be brief, but just what's a good shot and what's a better one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's good. We've got to got to figure that out. Yep. And, and I feel like the majority of the guys get that, right? But as you said, I love that phrase you used, untimely selfishness from Caleb. It feels like it just – one out of every five possessions, it's like, you know what? It's my turn. Here we go. And like that causes a team to not reach its its ceiling. And, mm -hmm. and if this team wants to get there, that has to be removed from this team. And I don't mean Caleb being removed. I don't mean his scoring. I just mean the decision making. I, like how long have we been talking about that? It's got to get at, at this point. I feel like you just got to say that's what you get with Caleb Love you know, you got to ride the highs and the lows like it or not. Now, as Carolina has often done, of course, as soon as Boston College got it down to one, what happened? Caleb Love hit a three. Caleb Love, I think Leakey got a steal, uh, pitch ahead to Caleb, tried an alley to Mondo. It got tipped back to him. He puts it in and then RJ free throws 7-0 run later and you're back up eight. But you, you're not going to be able to do, not every team is Boston College. And so Carolina has to do some of this that we're talking about. For those of you listening and watching, would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. What does Carolina have to do to put their foot on the throttle and never let up? Coming up in just a second, Pac and I want to share with you our Four Corners recap of this game, plus our Kilby and Shady stats of the game. We know you're here for that noise. We'll do that in just a second. But first, this episode is brought to you by Bet online your number one source for sports betting info stats news and analysis get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from the nfl playoffs going on right now to college and professional basketball they got it all at bet online make sure you check out their line for saturday's big time rivalry game when carolina hosts nc state they're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info so head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about all the trends in action bet online where the game starts let me also remind you guys to check out our brand new show on Locked On Network, Locked On College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball all in one place. Plus, hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. All right, Mr. Coach Pat Kilby, our Four Corners recap, where we just point out four things we thought were really important in this game and point to either short or long-term things. Number one, here's the thing for me. Carolina is doing a decent job of getting the ball to Armando Baycott. There are times when there is a clear and delivered message from the coaching staff, get the ball inside to Armando Baycott, but it's still not enough as as good a job as mondo is doing carolina has to do more there is no reason that he should be the third leading player in shot attempts in this game like he was caleb had 18 shot attempts rj 13 and mondo 11 and like the, they just have to go to him more he has to touch the ball in some form or fashion on literally every Carolina possession. You got the ACC player of the year on your team. You cannot forget about him. What do you think, Pat? No, I, I totally agree. I mean, the dude had 20 points and he had the third most shot attempts. I think it's <laughs> it's absurd that he's, first of all, he's that efficient. Second of all, he's not getting more touches. Um, and here's the thing, and I know we've talked about it before, but the guards are more efficient and effective when he is touching the ball. So to me, it's not, I mean, it's just not making sense why sometimes they're seemingly not bought into that idea. Yep. Um, 
And it, because it's not like Armando is a black hole. He is a willing and capable passer. Like you're going to see that. Like when Carolina goes up to Syracuse here in about a week, he going to be right there at, at the high post di- carving things up, right? Get ready for that. But like, and so that it, if he's a black hole, I get why you don't go to him as much. Yeah. And, and here's the thing too. I mean, if you really think about it, he had 11 shot attempts and I don't know the exact number, but at least two or three of those were off offensive rebounds. Yep. So, I mean, he's really only getting seven or eight post-entry shots up, which literally proves the point. He's not a black hole. He's, (laughs) he's finding his teammates, you know? So uh, I, I do hope that we continue to establish that, especially like we talked about in our last section or segment, when we're trying to put teams away, give him the ball. Good things and happen when it gets there. That's right. And that's when Boston College made their run is when, well, first of all, first of all, that's not a phrase. First of all, it was when he was out of the game. Uh, Pete Nance was getting abused a little bit in there and understandably so first game back in a while. But um, even when Armando was back, like he just wasn't getting enough touches. Second thing in our four corners recap. Coming into the game, one of the uh, on yesterday's show, one of the what to watch fors that I gave you was that Boston College is one of the worst three point shooting teams in the nation and one of the worst at defending the three point shot. They came in 356 out of 363 in three point percentage, 28 percent, and 351st in three point uh, percentage allowed at 37.9. And I'm telling you, if I tell you something, you got to listen to it. It played out in this game. Boston College goes 0 for 6 from 3, while Carolina hits 10 of 29. Not a great percentage for the Tar Heels, but they did make 10. They made more than Boston College took. When you make 10, the other team makes 0. That adds up to a plus 30 on the scoreboard. Big stuff there and then number three on our four corners recap rj davis staying with the three-point shot has been filling it up from three earlier in the season pack we were kind of concerned because not only was caleb shooting poorly from three but rj was as well and and when your backcourt is not filling it up from three and and pete nance is not doing his uh, a brady manic impression then you're kind of up a creek without a paddle so let's put some numbers on it first nine games of the season RJ Davis shot 26.2% from three, 11 of 42. In the ele- in the last seven games, RJ is shooting 51.2% from three, 21 of 41. And on the season, he's up to a career high 38.3%, 36 of 94. So this turnaround has been phenomenal. And he is getting to the point, like one of the things we said this offseason, with Brady Mannix, um, high volume, high percentage three-pointers gone, either Caleb or RJ is going to have to step up and fill those shoes. And RJ is moving directly in that direction right now. Great stuff from RJ. And then pack fourth, and I want to get your thoughts on this one. Our fourth part of our Four Corners recap is uh, Pete Nance was back in in this game and moved right back into the starting lineup. And then we also learned right before tip off that Jalen Washington was going to be out with a sprained ankle. Um, Man, this poor Carolina team just can't seem to all get healthy at the same time. How difficult is that to manage these guys shuttling their ways in and out? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely difficult. And, you know, I've already kind of touched on it before. It's already been – rocky enough because no one has seemingly had just a clearly defined role or a clearly defined you're getting 15 to 20 minutes a game so it's already been kind of rocky and then you talk about shaver being out and nance going out and coming back but washington being out it never it just feels like we haven't had three four slash fives be healthy all year at the same you know or at least at the same time yeah uh, yeah. And that I think that will also prove to be huge for us depth wise. If if Jalen, especially the way he's been playing here recently, gets back to 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 normal, and then Nance is obviously able to stay recovered and stay healthy, just being able to rotate those three and keep fresh bodies, but keep size and length out there for you know defensive purposes and rebounding purposes. I think that makes a huge difference. Yeah, 
Absolutely does. So great to have Pete Nance back. Uh, started off the game a couple three in the first couple minutes. Great stuff. Kind of faded away a little bit after that, and understandably so. He's just coming back from this back injury. I'm sure the, the coaching staff is taking that uh, baby steps at a time. Let us get to our Kilby stat of the game and our Shady stat of the game. Peck, what you got? Hey, real quick, Isaac, I did want to touch on RJ shooting. Mm. On the third, yeah. the third corner there. Yeah, one of my things I've been thinking about, and, and you may have mentioned it before. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, his finger. Remember at the beginning of the season, he had I don't know if he broke it or jammed right. it or whatever. He, right. he missed some time. Yep. I think that that's finally starting to get back to normal. That's a good word, and uh, that may be um, a reason why we've seen an uptick in three point percentage. Um, but as far as Kilby stat of the game. Eight for 11 is the Kilby stat of the game. Ooh, what, what's that all about? Eight yeah. for 11. Tell me more. What eight for 11 is, is exactly what Armando Baycott shot from the field. Eight for 11. And the reason why I point that out is just, that's just total efficiency, um, which is obviously huge for Carolina. And the what he did, you know, 20 points, 16 rebounds. But Caleb really didn't do a bulk of his scoring till the last what five or six minutes right. yep him, him and rj literally backpacked us to this victory in my opinion um and it wasn't just them too i'm not taking credit away from anybody else i'm just saying offensively what they did was huge for us so that's my stat of the game i love that as for mine want to get, get some uh leaky black love in here um and it's not for that beautiful three-pointer he hit early in the game which whoo that was the most confident shot I've ever seen him take and the deepest shot I've ever seen him make. Great stuff. But I want to look at another one of his underappreciated things. Leaky Black finishes this game with four steals, Coach Pat Kilby. Ties a career high. But I bring it up not because of those four, but because of this. Leaky Black has six straight games with multiple steals now and 10 straight games with at least one steal. His career high for a single season for steals is 40, which was his sophomore year. He's already at 31 this year. And so you better believe he's going to blow right by that number. And so uh, Leaky Black up over 150 steals. So all those stat thresholds we've talked about, he's reached another one at that 150 steals. Great stuff there from our guy, Leaky Black. Well, we want to wrap up today's show getting into some quick hitters, just odds and ends from this game that we thought were important. We will do that in just a second. All right, Pat Kilby, let us talk about just a few more things, some odds and ends, random observations, quick hitters, as I like to call them. And the first one, I want to give some Armando Baycott updates because he is just on the verge of a couple major Carolina records and it's cool you know why because both of them have a shot at being accomplished saturday at home with a big game versus nc state get this man off his feet for a couple days let that ankle rest up some more here it is armando baycott had 20 and 16 in this game he now has double doubles in back-to-back -back games in the first half just stupid, stupid, cool stuff right there. But anyway, his double-double in this one against Boston College ties him with Billy Cunningham, as you're probably aware, with 60 career North Carolina double-doubles. So a double-double on Saturday against NC State, he would be the career Carolina dub-dub record holder. The other thing, Armando came into this game 33 rebounds shy of tiling, ty tying Tyler Hansborough for the most rebounds in a Carolina career. Well, he had 16 in this game, meaning, quick math, he needs 17 against NC State to tie Tyler Hansborough 18 to break the record. How great would it be against one of your bitter rivals to set two Carolina career records? I love that, Pac. What, man, what, what? How like anytime you knock Tyler Hansborough off of any record book, you done something good. What what is this man's legacy at North Carolina? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's he's beloved, um, and I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I think Tyler Tyler Hansborough is the the standard. Yes. And that's a great way if, to put that. If you surpass that, 
you've done, you've not just done something right. You've done a lot of things right. And so um, can we also get a petition started to make sure that T hands is in the house on Saturday? I've been wondering about that. I know. Yes, uh, we absolutely need to so do that. Let's, let's get him there. And then I just want to point out, you know, you had a tweet today that just, or yesterday that just about broke the internet and it was a lot to do with the fact that Baycock could have another year if he wants it. So imagine what these records could be if he comes back. I mean, they could literally be at a point where it's, it's unbreakable. Yeah. Now, they would obviously have an asterisk beside them if that happened. But, I mean, it, it's going to happen if, if he wants to. And listen, all credit to you. You you were the one that talked about that quite a bit this summer. Like, I think one of your bold predictions was that it would happen. And so, um, man, just – the thought of that uh, happening, I think, and, and we will talk about this more in depth at other times. It's becoming to be more realistic for me because Carolina is not having the explosive year they expected to have. And because of some of the injuries he's endured, uh, you know, it's like, I, I, I just wonder if there's like a, I want to have a healthy year and I want to just be a baller team and just do unprecedented stuff. And you combine that with the already possibilities of like, you're making all this money. You're not going to be either an, a high NBA draft pick or any kind of NBA draft pick. Why not come back, play in front of a national TV audience under the lights and just be one of the biggest names in college. Drew Timmy did it this year. Would love to see Mondo do it next year. By the way, let me, let me just say something about Mondo's averages this season. His per game numbers are lower now because of that Virginia game because he technically played in it, but didn't he had zero points and one rebound that kills your average. Think about it like um, your grades in school. If you get a zero in on a on a grade in school, it like kills you might have an A and that brings you down to a B just because of that one zero. So think think about it kind of like that in this case. A zero in a game you play really hurts your per game average. To that point, Armando, following the Boston College game, is averaging 17.4 points a game and 10.9 rebounds per game. Well, if you take out that Virginia game, then he's averaging 18.5 points a game, which would put him instead of fourth in the ACC at second, just behind Turquavion Smith, who you mentioned earlier. And it bumps his rebounds back up to 11.6 in the conference, which moves him from second in rebounds per game to first. And so I just want to keep that in mind as people are making the case for or against Armando Baycott, that his per game averages have been dinged because of that basic goose egg against Virginia. So let's just, folks, help me start trumpeting that noise now so that we don't hear like uh, Armando Baycott's averages are down. Cause he took a loss in the Virginia game. Okay. I just, that's a soapbox for me that I'm going to be hitting <laughs> the rest of the season. I don't want to hear anything about it. Um, one thing pack, I know you had wanted to, to have a little bit of a conversation about, maybe this can be the last thing we touch on Caleb. Once again, with some late game shot making capability, is he starting to break out of his slump? What are you seeing? You know, Gosh, that's such a huge question because every time I feel like he's about to, he it, it doesn't happen. So yep. Yep. I, let, let me give you his first half versus second half numbers to help okay. the conversation. Yeah. First half of the Boston College game, two of nine from the field, O of four from three, O of one from the free throw line. Uh, by the way, zero assists, one turnover. No blocks, no steals, no rebounds. Second half, Caleb Love, five of nine from the field, two of six from three, one rebound, still no assist. So no assist in the game and one more turnover. So there you go. Definitely shot better in the second half. Yeah. And what was it overall? Six. It was, sorry, let me get back to it. Uh, I want to say like seven for 18. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not. Yep. Awful. Seven for 18. Yep. That's slightly below 50%. Um, I think that he's starting, although he still has some selfishness in him at times, it seems. He's starting to kind of figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that Coach Davis has challenged him to be a better passer, which <laughs> clearly didn't happen in this game. But whenever he is doing that, I do think that makes him better and more effective. Um, just like anything else, when your teammates are more involved, that frees you up. And so if he can ever figure that out and become that consistently and then get that 
attack the rim mentality instead of settle for long twos or off the dribble pull up threes, then I think he could become a lot more effective. Hmm. And you know, there's times where he shows flashes of that and then he kicks back out of it, back to his old habits. Tonight, in the last, you know, few minutes of the game, I thought he was more in that attack mode. Yep. Now, granted, he had a lob that was kicked back to him and he finished. <laughs> it. But yeah. he was still, nonetheless, he was actually attacking and he was trying to create for a teammate. And like I said, I know that was just pure luck, but good things happen when you do that. That's and right. that was a good thing that happened. And so we need to see that more consistently. Uh, but I do think he's he's trending in the right direction. And just like I believed RJ was going to have his uptick and now he's had it, I do believe Caleb's going to have his. Yeah, I think so too. And and when he does, I, man, I Carolina could could really put some things together and, and make a run similar to last year's. And we're getting kind of close-ish to that point of the season. We're not quite there yet, but um, we are very close to it good stuff today on the show as always carolina gets a win you'd like it to be a bit prettier but listen a win in conference play is a win in conference play especially now as we turn our attention to the first nc state matchup of the season as you said earlier time to put terquavion smith and his sunglasses in their place friends that's it for today's episode of locked on tar heels thanks so much for joining us you can follow the show on twitter at locked on heels you can follow pack at coach underscore k23 make sure you do that you can follow me at isaac shade you can also email the show locked on tar heels at gmail.com would love for you to reach out to us send us nominations for the heel of the week and the heel of the week love getting those also don't forget to subscribe to the show like i've said uh the past couple shows we're nearing the one year anniversary of me hosting locked on tar heels and would love to just see an explosion as we get there with subscriptions and listens and all that great stuff for your second listen check out locked on's brand new podcast locked on college basketball myself and andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court Plus, hear from big-name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube, Odyssey, and anywhere else you get podcasts. Hey, really appreciate you hanging out with us on Hump Day, reveling in a Carolina victory no matter how pretty or ugly it was. And a reminder, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel, and you know it to be true. (laughs) Until tomorrow, peace. Peace.